Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us and hope all of you are keeping safe. Uh, this is Manish Grover, your host uh, with uh, Digital Asset. Uh, and I've um, got uh, Rakesh Prasad, uh, VP of Digital at Innove, with me here. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Rakesh. And, yeah. and also I have Arvind Rao, Enterprise Architect from Innove Digital uh, with, us, with us on the webinar today. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so we've got a very nice webinar in store for you today. We're talking about supply chains, big problems. Uh, so show you how we can achieve value chain visibility across uh, the network using smart contracts and blockchain, and also touch upon a little bit of uh, the supply to demand matching problem that we are facing. Um, so first, uh, you know, we are going to take you through some of the key supply chain challenges and overview of those, um, touch upon the agility problem that we have, um, responsiveness and visibility when it comes to demand and supply matching. Uh, then we also will take you through a live app uh, that Innova has built, um, an end-to-end -end app that was actually developed to track and handle the healthcare PPE equipment for during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so as you know, the entire supply chains got disrupted. Um, it was very difficult to procure items, um, you know, and there was a lot of um, um, a lot of lot of procurement challenges. Uh, so Innova built out a app to show how we can bring multiple sellers and buyers onto the same network and how we can track an item end to end, uh, making procurement uh, pretty easy actually. So they're going to talk about a little bit on that, uh, show you uh, you know what the smart contract layer looks like, and then actually give you a demo of how it works. Um, so just a couple of quick things uh, before we start. Um, I am recording this session, so we'll share a recording and also the presentation with you after the webinar. So if by any chance you need to drop off, feel free to do that. Uh, you should receive the recording uh, later tomorrow. Um, and uh, obviously feel free to you know put, put your questions in the chat box. We want to keep it as interactive as possible. Um, so you know, place your questions either in the Q and A section of the webinar or in the chat box, uh, and we'll I'll keep looking at them and I'll uh, and I'll bring them up for discussion at the right time. Um, so with that, um, Rakesh, why don't you uh, kick off by introducing Inove, and then we can dig into the overview of the supply chain challenges. Absolutely, thank you, Manish, and good afternoon, everybody. Right? So it's great to be on this interesting webinar with Digital Asset, right? So Inove is a partner for Digital Asset and you know, as an organization, we are headquartered in Atlanta. One of the key things that I definitely wanted to highlight for, for us as an organization, right? One of the core values and one of the core focus areas for us is leveraging technology to solve a very pertinent and a very pressing customer problem, right? So for us, being a digital and analytics firm, our focus has always been around how do we solve a customer problem, right? It's not about just doing technology for the sake of technology. And that's where this whole opportunity with working with this asset was very exciting because we figured out a very, very pertinent problem that was existing today in the industry, which was further, I would say, amplified with COVID-19 coming in and you know creating this kind of a scenario that we are in, right? And we took it head on and it was great working with this asset. As an organization, I think uh, from a focus standpoint, supply chain visibility, process digitization and digital transformation are some of the core focus areas for us uh, from a service offering perspective. Right? Manish, you can move on. Yeah, thank you very much, Rakesh. Um, uh, so now, you know, let's get into some typical challenges that um, that we often face in the in supply chain. So I'll bring up the whole slide. Um, obviously, you know, as we know, there are multiple stakeholders, um, you know, right from the buyer to the seller. Sellers have probably multiple suppliers, um, you know, there's international shipping um, and all of that involved. Uh, and obviously, you know, it leads to several, uh, you know, value chain visibility and, you know, data silos, uh, silo problems. Um, so Rakesh, um, you know, in your view, what are some of the, what are some of the challenges that you see in the market, the client space? Um, and, you know, uh, touch upon a little bit on the root causes as well. Sure, Manish. I think, see, what we see, if you look at what are the, some of the, you know, patterns or some of the issues that symptoms that you see, right? I think one of the biggest gaps that we have seen is the pace at which the decision making happens, right? And I think that is one of the big gaps that we have seen uh, as the supply chain starts getting more and more global and more and more spread, the pace of decision making starts taking a hit, right? And organizations need to start thinking, how do 
they keep up with that, right? Second big impact has always been around what the customer experience is going to be based on how you are kind of adhering to all the commitments that you're making from a delivery standpoint. Uh, and we have all heard about the perfect order fulfillment scores, making sure you're delivering the right product, the right time, the right quantity, right? So the overall customer experience is one of the big gaps that we have started seeing as the supply chain starts to not behave in the planned manner, right? And then of course that leads to a financial impact around the overall organization's operations, right? On the revenue standpoint, when you start going out of stock or on the cost standpoint, when you start procuring to fulfill some spike in demands and you have to go outside the preferred network of suppliers, right? And then overall, then it comes down to also being how responsive is your supply chain to not just take care of what you have planned for, but also be you know, flexible enough to get ready for anything that comes in, which we all, it's very hard for us to anticipate, right? So I think those are some of the large symptoms that we see, right? Which happens uh, from a challenge standpoint. But if you were to kind of take it a level deeper and, and try and understand where these challenges really come from. And I think one of the biggest thing is from a visibility standpoint, it becomes very challenging to get an end-to-end -end visibility, right? Uh, larger organizations are investing so heavily in trying to integrate across different parties that is involved, right? But still the, asp the amount of visibility you have from an end-to-end -end supply chain perspective that is limited primarily because every stakeholder tends to operate in its own silo of operation, right? And if you have a manufacturer, they are operating in their world. If you have a 3PL and a shipper, they are operating in their world. And if you have a buyer, they're operating in their world. So I think that itself, picks a big visibility issue and there's is a lot of investment that is happening on trying to how do we build that whole visibility aspect, right? And with that, what it leads to Manish and others on the call is the fact that you start having a lot of data inconsistency issue because the way a manufacturer versus a shipper versus a, you know, so, you know, actual buyer, they are kind of looking at their data. They, while they're looking at the same set, the granularity varies, the definitions vary, at what frequency they want to look at that right. variant that starts creating a lot of data inconsistency issues, right? And finally, most of the supply chain that is built today is always built based on historical trends. Yes, AI and machine learning is kind of changing the game, but majority still is based on historical trends of what you've seen in the past and how you've planned for it, right? Which then it gets to a place where exception handling becomes a challenge, right? And to manage exceptions, typically it is always extra cost that goes into manage the exceptions and come along and how do we fulfill that, right? Those are some of the big things that we have seen from a supply chain arena standpoint, right? Which is driving yeah. these challenges that exist today. Yeah, and a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, so on the financial impact side, at least on the cost side, uh, th that and responsiveness is sort of uh, linked together because uh, in order to be more responsive, um, if you don't have a good supply chain, you know, like a demand sensing mechanism, then you tend to keep more inventory, uh, you know, carry more inventory, which obviously leads to leads to higher costs as well. Um, there are things that uh, that uh, you know that are initiatives that are going on in the industry, such as uh, retailer links. So, big retailers such as Walmart, for example, are building dedicated retailer links for their suppliers. Um, essentially, telling the suppliers that hey, here's our inventory, here's our demand patterns you figure out um, and make sure that we don't have a stock out or you carry the inventory in the right places. So a lot of those initiatives are underway, but then again, each of those are operating, um, they are you know, excellent initiatives uh, leading to AI, you know, demand sensing, um, you know, techniques that are being put in, retailer links that are data sharing is happening. But then obviously like Rakesh mentioned, uh, on the left-hand side or the bottom, uh, you know, all of the stakeholders are operating across application islands uh, and across company islands as well. So while Walmart may be sharing it, uh, you know, um, not all suppliers may be geared to access the same data in the same fashion. Um, so there's a lot of investment that is needed. So with that, uh, let's move on to the, the demand supply matching impacts. Um, so we built out a very simplistic flow. Uh, you know, on the left-hand side, you have a retailer and this could be any point of sale, of course, retailers or even hospitals in our case, uh, when we get into the demo. Um, then we get into suppliers and manufacturers. There could be multiple, even a chain of suppliers and manufacturers sometimes. And then obviously uh, there's fulfillment and distribution uh, and there's latency everywhere. So Rakesh, do you want to talk a little bit about the, about the various kinds of issues we face in such a value chain? Sure, Manish. I think this is a very classic example of what we are seeing in the industry today, right? So essentially, 
your demand signals today, which means knowing exactly how much your retailers need and how much products you are going to sell is always based on a pattern. And as I said, there is always a delay in getting the real demand coming through, right? And what then suppliers and manufacturers are trying to do to fulfill that is based on their planning and based on their historic data, they're able, they're creating some sort of, I would say inventory or flexibility to continuously adjust to the way the demand is going to fluctuate. It's not that it has been done randomly here. The industry has matured a lot and now everything is based on a demand signal that is as real time as potentially can be. But still, if you look at the actual execution of this, it still works on at least four to six weeks of planning or seven weeks of planning that needs to be put together for every manufacturer or supplier to kind of fulfill the demand that they're looking for, right? And based on that, they're planning the inventories that they carry either at the distribution center or at their manufacturing location. And that's a cost that they're carrying, right? And then they're trying to make sure that the amount of inventory is optimized maximum for some sort of outlier scenarios, right? And all of this is done primarily because it's very hard in the end-to-end -end supply chain to get real-time visibility into a demand that is potentially coming up and so that the supply chain can be built in a way that it can fulfill it, right? So since they're always dependent on, I would say a handshake happening and that handshake leads to everybody planning for contingency and that contingency then leads to inventory cost. And then of course, also from a distribution and fulfillment channel, it becomes very difficult to figure out at which DC or at which area where you want to kind of keep what stock is there, right? Yeah. And all the organizations are trying to use a lot of data and analytics and machine learning is definitely taking this a notch up for the organizations to kind of make it more I would say real time as much as possible and more realistic to the scenario that is on the ground. But COVID-19 was a classic example, right? Because what it threw, nobody was prepared for it, right? And that is where the fact is that nobody, since you're not seeing the real time rise in the demand, you're not able to respond real time into how do you fulfill it, right? And how do you expand your supply chain to maybe fulfill that demand, right? And I think that brings us to what we wanted to kind of cover it. This was, I think, COVID-19 for whatever it was, I know it was a challenging time for all the organizations going through, but I think it was also a very good eye opener for a lot of us in this industry to say that, how are we geared up today and what do we need, right? And if you look at the purpose of why we are here today, the demand of PPE just went through the roof, right? And the PPE demands are, was varying depending on which state, which country, at what point in time of this whole, you know, COVID cycle, as we call it, flattened the curve that they were on the demand was fluctuating so high that the traditional supply chain was not able to manage it, right? And when we got, started talking to a couple of, uh, you know, VC funds here and a uh, couple of buyers in New York City, they were struggling to match up the demand to the supply because it was not that there were no suppliers out there that could provision the PPE requirement that was there. It was just that they were outside the traditional chain of fulfillment that is there, right? And to be able to bring them on board and to make sure how quickly can they be in the ecosystem, that itself was throwing up a challenge where all of these transactions then started happening on a phone and spreadsheet, right? And the demand started becoming so high that it was very hard to kind of manage it and then be at a place where you can build in some transparency and visibility across for everybody, right? And that's where this became a very, very exciting problem for us to take on as part of a new technology or a new solution that we wanted to try out, right? Yeah. yeah. So there is a question from Stephen and uh, Stephen, I'll uh, address that question in the next couple of slides. It's uh, essentially, uh, you know, he's asking changes do not flow from one system to the other. So whose responsibility is it for communicating the changes to the shared data? Uh, and who has responsibility that the system with out of date information gets the latest uh, accurate data? So that's obviously, you know, that's obviously the bulk of what we are doing today. Um, you know, reconciling between systems. Um, and uh, I just wanted to touch upon the demand and supply matching angle that uh, Rakesh pointed out, is that uh, on this slide, if we, if we go back to that uh, flowchart that we had, um, you know, routing plans and, you know, who, uh, you know, what to supply to which location is uh, pretty much defined here. And then obviously it is carried out but then because there is, uh, you know, because there is obviously a lag between the time demand signals are processed and the orders are placed, and then the shipment is uh, initiated, uh, there is very little um, 
flexibility here in case demand patterns change to change the change how you are supplying items. So in the case of COVID, for example, depending on the uh, number of test cases that were coming up um, and the number of hospitalizations that were happening, the demand was fluctuating widely. Uh, say, for example, between New Jersey and New York. If there is a set of uh, PPE uh, bound for New York, and you know that suddenly the demand has changed and it's uh, required more in New Jersey at the last minute. Is it possible to quickly change that, uh, change that pattern and, and move into the, um, you know, move that, move that inventory first to New Jersey and then fulfill, uh, fulfill New York. And Manish, so, if, I, if I may, right, just to add one point to what Stephen was asking, right? So from a responsibility standpoint, I think that's another fascinating point that based on who is more, powerful in the ecosystem he sets the demand he sets the rules of the game right so if you are engaging in walmart or amazons of the world they set the rule of the game and you have to play with their game they will tell you where which dc what procurement what is the product how is it right and everybody has to follow what they are trying to define as their supply chain and their process right with limited flexibility that you will have from your side and there you have to optimize based on what the big retailers need right and if you now come to small retailers, they typically are relying on manufacturers to be able to have that visibility and plan so that their outlets are not going to get out of stock, right? So I think the roles and responsibilities change based on where you are engaging in which party has the more control in that equation, right? And it's very subjective to each of the relationships that you carry. Yeah. So that brings us to, uh, Stephen, I think this would answer your question. So um, generally what we are doing here is, um, you know, traditionally there are silos as uh, we've already covered uh, between different applications as well as different companies. Um, and the responsibility is the, you know, the responsibility of making sure that the data is updated is, uh, is the process of reconciliation. Every application, every company is trying to sync up with the, with their counterpart on what is the, what is the latest, um, you know, status um, of the inventory and, uh, you know, of the, of the orders of the demand and of the supply. Um, and obviously because of this constant reconciliation, it leads to a lot of latency um, you know, between, between organizations. And uh, there are obviously a lot of process breaks. Uh, you know, um, technology fails sometimes. You know? So sending the data may take say eight hours to consolidate and send it to someone. And they might need some more time to make sense of the data, process it, uh, run it through their algorithms, uh, you know, send it to their uh, send it to their procurement systems and all that stuff. So there's a constant uh, reconciliation that is happening, and the idea for what we want to discuss uh, today is this, right? So how do we enable a common source of truth um, within and between enterprises while maintaining privacy and confidentiality requirements and regulatory and compliance requirements? Um, and that's uh, that's uh, that's the purpose of. Um, of what digital asset is building. Um, so we've uh, built out this, um, built out DAML, which is a smart contract language which runs on, uh, you know, different types of blockchains. Um, and the purpose is this, you know, how do we help um, clients um, tap into a single golden source of information while maintaining privacy? And it's in, in a sense, everybody sharing a common mutual uh, business process versus having to break that business process as soon as organizational boundaries are, are crossed. Um, and the technology is currently in use at um, many uh, you know, large organizations, systemically consequential organizations. You see the Australian Securities Exchange at the bottom. That's not a supply chain organization, but uh, you know, they are replacing their entire post-trade uh, equity settlement uh, platform uh, with a smart contract based uh, application. Uh, which is allowing uh, you know all of the different participating banks and ASX itself um, to provide a common golden source of information to everyone versus having to rely on messaging and back and forth uh, transmission of information. Uh, similarly, in the healthcare space, uh, there's a prototype that was built for Change Healthcare, which is obviously one of the largest exchanges in the U.S. Uh, they you know when you have a claim at a at a provider, say a doctor, your claim needs to go back all the way to the insurer. Sometimes there are multiple claims, uh, multiple providers have uh, engaged with you as they rendered their treatment to you. All of those different claims have to be consolidated, sent to the insurer. Insurer has to make sure you know, you're eligible, then they make the payments. Uh, you as a consumer have very little idea and as also the providers have very little idea of what's happening with that claim uh, and what is the status. So change is uh, trying to change that. 
Um, essentially, this is what the technology looks like. Um, it's a smart contracts runtime. It's open source, so there's no cost to it. Um, you have a smart contract enabled application on the top that automatically runs on multiple distributed ledgers. So you can either run it on a distributed ledger or you can run it on a traditional database like PostgreSQL, uh, Amazon Aurora, you know, or the, even the Amazon AWS Q, QLDB that came out recently. Um, and the beauty of this platform is that each of these different um, networks can also be connected with each other. And that's what we are calling the Canton protocol. So if uh, one of the uh, ecosystems um, is, uh, is running on say uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth or Fabric, there's another ecosystem that is uh, running on Corda, R3's Corda platform. And there's another enterprise which is uh, processing their internal transactions using a plain old database like AWS Aurora or uh, PostgreSQL. Each of them will be able to have um, um, you know, atomic transactions uh, across, across their networks. Mm -hmm. So what does it allow? Um, essentially, we'll cover that as we go through the demo in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, you know, no duplicate party onboarding. So as you know, um, as you'll see in the demo, in the COVID-19 demo, uh, there are multiple buyers, multiple sellers, and every buyer has to uh, take care of onboarding their own sellers, even though that same seller uh, may be uh, furnishing the same information uh, to multiple buyers. Each of the buyers have their own seller list, um, you know, and there's uh, very little um, potential for reuse. Uh, similarly, the concept of inventory as a digital asset. So we are used to dealing with data records um, instead of dealing with an inventory. So if there's a piece of inventory, say a package, say a ventilator in the COVID-19 case, that ventilator should be tracked all the way from quote request uh, to providing a quotation, to being shipped, to being delivered. Um, and uh, we should be able to track that one ventilator uh, and take actions on it uh, versus treating it as a data row. Uh, and then obviously, you know, there's a single version of it. And one of the things I wanted to point out was much better regulatory compliance as well, as you'll see in the demo. Um, because there is a golden source of information which is completely confidential to the party that is, ex uh, that is uh, living on the network, you could define a regulatory body, for example, which would get a snapshot of certain amount of information through every transaction. So who's procuring, uh, you know, what kind of equipment, um, you know, from which country, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and uh, customs information, FDA related information, all of that can easily be funneled through to the regulatory body, which can also be on the network. So it makes the job of uh, compliance, uh, you know, the cost of compliance uh, very low. And Manish, if I may, right, this is Rakesh. So I think these were when we started out thinking about building this whole solution, right? I think uh, one of the biggest reasons that we chose to go with digital asset and use their DAML platform was primarily around these, right? Because if we were to kind of build an app, which was going to cross boundaries of each organization or each parties that are going to play, we did not have the time to build something required for massive data integration to kind of set the trust on the data and make sure everybody is agreeing to what they're seeing, right? And that's where one of the big, and that was, I would think the core driver for us to look at a platform uh, of a distributed leisure platform and then work with digital asset to build it on their DAML platform, right? Because it's open source and it is very flexible in terms of how the app can be written and how easily the app can be integrated to the DAML layer, right? So I think those yeah. are some of our experiences of, and maybe the reasons why we chose uh, distributed leisure first, and then of course, using DAML to build that out other than any other platform. Right? Exactly, yeah. And I think data domicile was also an important consideration. Um, so there are parties from different geographies in this case, um, say you've got a supplier in China, and then you've got a you know, buyer in, uh, in the US, and there could be an intermediary in another location. Um, you know, typically govern, you know, regulations don't permit your data to be shared across international boundaries. And, and you have to put, you know, several mechanisms in place to enable that. Uh, to do that with a legacy technology would have taken an inordinate amount of time. Uh, with uh, DAML smart contracts and deploying it on a blockchain network, uh, it makes it very easy because now you can share, you can uh, define uh, data sharing and privacy uh, at a granular level. Um, so that makes it uh, much easier. So with that, uh, I mean, let me see if there are any uh, questions. Uh, I think there's one from Stephen, which we answered. Stephen, hopefully, hopefully that... Uh, Hopefully that answered your question. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to feel free to post in either the chat uh, or in um, or in the uh, Q and A section.
Okay, yeah, Stephen is saying yes, good. Um, so we're done. Okay, great. So now what I would like to do is, uh, I'd like to welcome Arvind, who is going to take us through uh, take us through the application, how they built it, and also uh, show us a live demo of how it works. Thank you, Anish, and hi, everyone. Uh, so as you can see, this is the application that we built, which is for COVID-19. Uh, we have got multiple parties that uh, interact in the whole supply chain. In our case, or in a typical supply chain, you have a buyer, a seller. Uh, buyer could be, for example, like CVS, a seller could be 3M or GE. Buyer typically has a buyer agent, which will be a rep from the company who's responsible for making sure that the order and everything, all the documentation and everything is correct. Uh, typically you have a shipper, which could be like a UPS or FedEx, uh, which is once the goods are reach stateside in the US, they kind of send it over to the uh, final destination, which could be in hospital and in our uh, business flow, that's when the order is completed. So the buyer creates basically the order, he selects everything, seller accepts it, creates an RFQ, creates a code, buyer agents approves everything that everything has been, uh, all the documentation, the FDA clearance, customs clearance and everything has been done. The shipper receives it, the hospital also receives it once and that's when the order is completed. So Manish, if you can make me the host, I will share the screen Yeah, and we can yeah. get into the demo. Yeah, let me do that. And um, also just wanted to point out, so this, uh, uh, even though this is a you know typical procurement, end-to-end -end procurement application, which can be uh, you know sort of thought about similar to a track and trace application, uh, but you know, because the way it is built, um, if you remember, we touched upon demand sensing um, you know, in the beginning. So each of these items, when they are being delivered, um, there's an angle of demand, uh, which is uh, you know, how many test cases, uh, how many, you know, there are how many positive test cases, which region has a higher traffic, et cetera. There are applications I know, and there are a couple of attendees on this webinar as well, uh, which are creating those applications. Those applications created in DAML will automatically interoperate with this application. So now you could uh, take the demand side of the, um, you know, of the equation and marry it with this, uh, you know, procurement end-to-end -end procurement of the PP uh, side of the equation. And now you could have an end-to-end -end solution, which sort of automatically takes the demand, you know, and most of it is going to be automated and algorithmic, but it takes the demand, makes the decisions using AI techniques, uh, and then it automatically routes your orders and uh, accordingly. Um, so that's what I wanted to point out. And um, oh, um, Arvind, yeah, we need, yeah, we need, needed to yeah, touch about this slide also. So this is what kind of a DAML smart contract looks like. As you can see, everything is declared in the model itself. Um, you can have the contracts, which are the legal documents or the uh, the processes that a particular user does. Parties are typically the people who can act on those. So all the access for what a document is, what the contract is, and all the authorizations, which is who, which party can do what, that is also declared in the DAML itself. If you see in the first line 525, 526, the buyer can create the code request, but the controller who is the seller, only he can do these actions, which are only the seller can accept it or reject it. And the buyer again at 536, he can cancel a code request. So the access as well as the role-based authorization, everything is declaratively declared inside the DAML itself. So there is no extra overhead of setting up who can do what, what are the permissions on each particular page or what are the functions, all those, all that is handled with DAML itself. And this makes development much easier because we are basically focusing on the business flow and not setting up uh, the backend or the overhead and those kind of things. Yeah, and uh, Arvind, I think uh, you were able to uh, document the entire preliminary business process. I think within a few days, I think you were able to test out a rudimentary version of the process flow. Right. Yeah, definitely. This definitely helped us and uh, time to market, the speed and everything was phenomenal. Um, once the business flow was defined, we could uh, basically knock out, knock it out, all the flow and everything in DAML within a few days. And the beauty of this is, beauty of DAML and the runtime is we define the business flow, everything, the runtime exposes everything through REST APIs. We use React uh, JS as the front end, but you can use multiple uh, front ends, whichever you're comfortable with. Everything is through REST APIs, the authentication, handling, and everything is handled by DAML itself. So that makes development really, uh, uh, really smooth. Uh, the COVID-19 app that we developed, we have created using DAML. We have deployed it on Project Dabble, which is the cloud version, the cloud platform for uh, uh, DAML. 
provided by digital asset itself. React.js was the front end, the uh, platform that we chose for making this uh, fr uh, application. So yeah. if, um, yeah. yeah. And I think uh, deploying, just wanted to touch upon Project Dabble for a second. Um, so for anybody who's uh, looking to develop Daml applications, Project Dabble provides an excellent target environment for you to um, you know, compile your Daml model basically, which and then deploy it on Project Dabble and uh, automatically you get everything that you would get from a managed platform. So for example, you don't have to worry about authentication, don't worry about infrastructure, scaling, security, and all of that, your applications are, um, you know, uh, are live automatically. Everything is managed in the back end with Project Devil. Uh, and it's uh, free to use. Uh, so if anybody is thinking of developing a Daml application, definitely give it a look. It's on projectdabble.com. Okay, so Arvind, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll give you the access now. Sure. Let me see, I think there's one more question. No, I think we're good. So let me make you the uh, presenter. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Arvind, I think you should be able to share now. Yeah. Yeah, please let me know if you can see the screen. Yeah, we can. So this is a project deployed on Project Dabble. Uh, if you see COVID-19 app, this is basically the admin. And uh, these are like all the internal. So Exchange is uh, basically all the metadata and everything that for this application is stored. Uh, the way that the application works is you log in onto Project Dabble, it creates a user, and then you assign the permissions to the user. And after that, it is logged down. So even the admin, if you see, I logged in as Arvind Rao, but there are multiple users that are logged in, the buyer, buyer agent, hospital, and seller. Even the admin doesn't have access to what the permissions or what the buyer is doing, so he has no visibility. So that helps a lot in the data security, as well as uh, integrity of the data. Exchange is kind of, it keeps track of everything that's happening in the system. So you can see there are multiple buyer agents, there are buyers, there are shippers, all the products are defined here. Yeah, so and exchange, hospitals is, exchange, and sellers, is right. you, exchange is what gives you the economies of scale. So you don't have to onboard the same supplier and the same product twice. Once you know that a product has FDA approval, for example, you know that product is available. And uh, obviously that can be configured. So Sellers might make it visible in some geographies. They may not want to make it visible in some geographies and stuff like that is definitely up to the seller. Uh, but then you have to do all of that onboarding just once. So supply, sellers are onboarded once, products are onboarded once, and then they are available for use as, as defined. And just to add all these actions that you're seeing ad by a riot shipper, this is all defined in the DAML. So no extra work was done. Everything is handled by Project Double automatically. Um, this is the application. Uh, this is the front end of the application. We can log in with Dabble, which ties into SSO. So right now we are using Google accounts. I log in as a buyer. Once it authenticates, it logs into your application. Uh, these are some of the completed orders that have been completed previously and previously demos and uh, this thing. Uh, the product catalog, these are the three products that we have set up for this application. So you can see you have gloves, you have respirators. Uh, you can create, you can create the cat, we can create the orders of what the orders are. This is for creating the uh, code request. You can select the sellers. So these sellers are again tied for each uh, buyer. Each buyer can onboard his own seller. So this creates, uh, this avoids redundancy and duplication. The due date when the quotes are due, we can select it up. Once we select that, it places it in the queue. If I log in as a seller, Actually, okay, we can do this. If I log in as a seller, I see on the quote request, I can see that this is the quote request that I received. If you see the buyer had selected two quote, two sellers, this is one of the sellers that he can see. Once he receives it, he receives this is the quantity, whether he can accept it. 
once he accepted he can say okay i'm going to sell it to you for three thousand uh, uh, dollars just a quick question um sellers will not be able to see each other's quotes and quote requests right correct so if you see right now the quote request he can see only the one that he has been assigned to nothing else he cannot see the product catalog he cannot see the quotes he cannot see anything else cargo initiated all the cargo which is handled by the shipper or the buyer agent or the hospital delivery he cannot see anything else he is he gets access to only the actions that he can do yeah and for everybody wondering i think the ui has been made using uh, just to speed up development we used a uh, um an existing React template uh, that was uh, customized, uh, which is open source and available on the uh, daml.com marketplace. Um, but obviously this front end can be customized a lot. In fact, Inove has customized it by showing all of these products and making sellers uh, visible to the buyer, et cetera. Um, so there's definitely customization, but it allows you to get off the ground much faster. Yeah, definitely. So once the seller can create a code, he can submit it. The buyer can actually receive the quote and you'll see that it received the quote from the seller, whether he can accept it or reject it. He can accept it and he can assign the buyer agent. So buyer agent is uh, the representative who will take care of making sure that all the documentation and everything is correct. Once he accepts it, then the seller can see it as the purchase order and then he can accept it. So when he accepts it, this creates a purchase order into an order. So if so if we go back to the workflow, which is the buyer created the products. Uh, I'm not sure what screen is showing. So give me one second. Yeah, we, are, we were looking at the flow chart. The end to end yeah, flowchart. Yeah, we're looking at the flowchart. Yeah. Okay. I'll just yeah. show it in this instead of going in a slideshow. So. Yeah. so the buyer created the products, it went to the it created a quote request. The seller it sent the RFQ to the seller. The seller accepted it, created a quote. He sent a quote. The buyer again accepted the quote, it created a purchase order. And the seller then accepted the purchase order, which created an order. The rest of the flow, um, due to limitation of time, we can skip those. But typically the buyer agent will get a notification. Uh, he can ask once it clears the FD and customs approval, uh, he can add it. Uh, just for the sake of this project, we uh, this application, we just made the buyer agent do the FD and customs. But in real life, you can have separate parties. Uh, the parties can be onboarded as many as we want, depending on uh, uh, the business case. Uh, for FDA, we can have a different party. The customs could be a different party. If there's a state approval, that could be a different party. And we can just tie those into the workflow and make them uh, authorized and access driven. Once yeah. the shipper in hospital, then it creates the orders completed. So we can just look at... Yeah, and Arvind, just a quick thing. So um, during this process, obviously once the product is shipped, you could also use... Um, your application can also use REST APIs and connect with a third party shipper, for example, to get the latest status of the shipment. So it doesn't have to be manually entered, right? Correct. Thank you, Correct. For that, Manish. Right? So as part of V2 of this application, that's what we have planned, right? Some of the key shippers and all, where we have the APIs available, we plan to integrate that and make sure some of these processes may not be manual, right? And you not be manual. They will get automatically updated with notifications going that the status has changed. Exactly. And I think you've got some AI algorithms running, which will automatically place the orders depending on the inventory level and all that stuff. So that's, so that's Correct. also Correct. potentially an improvement. Yes. And that's another, so even to choose the sellers based on their typical time in the past and those kind of performances, those are the enhancements that are planned on the app, right? Because as a buyer, you would like, if you have 10 suppliers, you'd like to make sure you're placing the order with the supplier, which has higher performance, parameters or whatever, right? Based on the algorithm that we put to recommend it, recommend the suppliers, right? So those are the added on capabilities that will that we plan to bring into the platform, right? As we go along. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, this is again logged in as a buyer. Uh, typically the flow is, uh, if you don't look at the parties, the purchase order, cargo, the, when the seller sends out the goods, for example, He's based out of China and he puts it on a ship. That's when the cargo gets initiated. 
he'll get a notification that's when the buyer agent will receive a notification that the goods have reached state side he'll clear the cargo when the fda clearances and everything is done shipment delivery is when we put it on to like fedex or ups when it needs to go state side uh, uh, for the local transport once he receives it then the hospital delivery will be when the hospital actually receives and they've received the goods and gets a clearance and basically that ends up with a completed order so if a completed order it keeps track of the whole workflow um, the whole order history everything is tracked um, the other good thing about daml and a distributed ledger is because everything is tracked and everything gets archived so there's an audit trail for every transaction that's happening and since since it's on a distributed ledger uh, which is basically a blockchain uh, functionality it's, it's it's more tamper proof because it's distributed on multiple systems so if you can see this is not the current order that we created but a previous order uh, everything is unique the reference id is system generated the ledger this is all the unique party ids who can manipulate on them what the price was when what is shipped who the shipper was like fedex or ups and which was a hospital and what the quantity is, the price, and everything. So this is, um, in, a, in a nutshell, what the application does. As you said, it's fully customizable to enhance it, to make any changes, add more parties, add more products, anything. It's very easy to do it using Demo. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Arvind. So uh, this is great. And uh, obviously, uh, just for the benefit of everyone, so Arvind, I'll just um, uh, start sharing again. Um, So just for the benefit of everyone, you can see that um, when we were here on this slide, um, this, this application, uh, this DAML application has been deployed on Project DAML uh, for simplicity, but obviously you could take the same application without any changes at all and deploy it on a blockchain of your choice. So if you're using Fabric, for example, or Sawtooth, you could deploy the same application on Fabric and, and Sawtooth or any other application. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's what we mean by DAML portability. Um, and you, know, you don't typically have to choose your blockchain and the target platform before you develop your application. So in this case, uh, Inove was initially going to deploy it on Sawtooth, for example, uh, but then we decided to deploy it on Project DAML to make it easier to manage and to easier to demo and prototype with, uh, uh, with the buyers and the sellers. And uh, the next step is to depending on uh, what the choice of technology is, um, and obviously many other considerations that go into choosing a platform, uh, you know, it can be deployed without any changes to, a, to, a, to another network as well. And uh, Rakesh, do you want to touch upon quickly the analytics portion of it, the AI angle that, uh, uh, you know, that- uh, Sure, Manish. Yeah. Sure, Manish. I think I wanted to kind of uh, bring that up as, uh, as one of the key things, right? So, see, the, this application that we have built, right? It is taking care of making sure the process and the process aspect of it and all the parties and the compliance aspect of it, all that is taken care, right? But there is another angle of how do you make it available to the users to get a status, get to know where it is, what's happening, what are the delays and make it more conversational rather than trying to go and run multiple reports, right? And that's where, uh, we are in a version two of this app. Uh, we in plan to integrate this app with our own conversational AI solution. We call it Sire. And that is nothing but uh, think of it for lack of a better term as a Alexa or a voice assistant for your business, right? It's an amazing solution that we have built that can port data from or pull data from any other underlying application. And this application could be one of it and then renders the inside as a way of asking a question like all of us are getting used to with all the voice enabled solutions that we have on our home, right? So that's the solution we plan to integrate where then it will start giving every party a clear visibility into where exactly the product is right now. If it's delayed, what is happening? If it's reaching on time, it's reaching on time, which all final locations is going to be delivered to what's the ET and all that good stuff, right? So that integration with our SIA solution is planned and you can go to our website in to take a look at the SIA application itself. Which yeah, is I'll, send out, I'll send out some of these in the, in the follow up email. And uh, obviously sure. aggregated information is very important. So how many orders have been placed? How many were delayed? You know, um, what seems like the trend, you know, what kind of uh, products are being, uh, are in demand recently 
etc so some of those aggregated bi related requirements can also be met yeah and the idea is then that becomes along with this app kind of then completely covers the i would say the full visibility aspect of your supply chain right? so that's where the end to end visibility starts coming into play perfect yeah so i think with that we also answered a few other questions that had come up uh, around uh, portability and uh, business intelligence so i'm hoping uh, Man- you know manish we have we have one question on the chat yeah let me see um okay great um you were saying salesforce and azure integration has already been announced or are you teasing them with this slide um yeah i think uh, those are in progress um you know uh, we can share information offline uh, yuri yeah and uh, indira uh, it looks like indira had a question uh, but i don't see your question indira are you do you still have it or Uh, no nope. i think uh, i think indra is good then so um, great uh, so i think yeah that brings us to uh, that brings us to the end of the end of the presentation hopefully this was useful um, so we tackled upon some of the key supply chain challenges including visibility and demand matching uh, which i hope everyone got a clear idea of uh, how to do that uh, using a using a smart contract based uh, platform deployed on either a distributed ledger or even a database and how do we allow for Uh, how do we bridge multiple application and data silos without requiring continuous reconciliation um yeah and uh, you know in the follow up email i'm i'm going to send you a recording the presentation as well as some other interesting links to the saya solution that rakesh mentioned uh, as well as a couple of other open source apps uh, including the open source daml react template uh, that was used for this application um so with that thank you very much uh, rakesh any closing thoughts Yeah I think I just uh, I was looking at the chat window right so Indra still has a question so I just requested her to type the question Indra you are on mute so we'll not you'll not be able to speak up the question so if you can type your question we can address that right so that way we can absolutely answer the question right and it's uh, we have time right so we are not running away so please go ahead and type your question and we will address it you can either use the chat window that you used is this a marketplace or a procurement yeah so indra the idea and manish let me take it another so indra's yeah. question is is this a marketplace for procurement of medical supplies so the answer is we have not yet made it the objective of this app was purpose built for all the medical supplies that we were requiring for covid 19 right so it our goal is to put it on my marketplace and make it enable for uh, anybody to use for any kind of procurement right so we don't want to restrict it to medical supplies right the objective was starting from there but the way app is designed and the way that we have chosen the technology this can be extended to procuring any products in your supply chain right so it's not yeah. restricted to yeah. sort of a uh, sort of a solution accelerator which uh, you can use to create your um, you can create your own marketplace using this application um so talk about supplier quality qualifying quality fd onboarding so manish you want to talk about the fd onboarding that we were anyways discussing yeah 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 so um obviously there's a workflow that goes into play when you onboard a supplier uh, and obviously their products um so all of those uh, you know are um, are easily uh, addressable in the solution so that's part of the onboarding process so when you onboard a supplier uh, you know you can request the right information from them validate that validate that and then permit the supplier uh, on the on the network uh, and also you could have um, you know periodic uh, qualification requirements or review requirements so whether it's 6 months or 1 year or when something changes uh, you could obviously put those triggers in place uh, you know that also brings up a very interesting uh, advantage uh, with such a solution is that uh, each of these fda certifications and onboarding um, is uh, automatically visible to all of the buyers so you know that saves a lot of operational overhead for that same process to be done by multiple buyers uh, as in the current scenario um and uh, you know yeah and uh, smart contract business rules typically you know the ecosystems are um, e- ecosystems are so this question uh, let me repeat the question how is the smart contracts business rules governed in this ecosystem with a multi party co- multi party collaboration Uh, so the idea is that uh, each of the parties who are on the network are agreeing to the business rules that have been defined in the workflow uh, including all of the supplier onboarding you know order placement uh, you know how do we assign a buyer's agent how do we get fda you know clearance etc 
all of that is automatically defined. Um, and if there are any changes that need to be made, uh, then multiple parties obviously have to agree to that change. Uh, one simple way that uh, most of the ecosystems are addressing that is by creating a central party, for example, like a consortium or designating a neutral party to take care of some of those things. Um, so, you know, requests for changes go into that party. That party does the collaboration and the, uh, you know, and the, um, and the coordination between multiple parties and changes are then released to the system. Yeah, and DAML is the protocol for interoperability. DAML defines the standard, the smart contracts, and then there is a separate protocol called the Canton protocol, which actually does the interoperability between multiple DAML networks. Um, so that was the final question from Indra. Um, Indra, does that help? Um, yeah, okay, great. So cool. So uh, thank you very much. We are almost out of time now. So uh, be on the lookout for the recording and the presentation that I'll send out um, after this session. Uh, maybe you'll receive it, I think, sometime tomorrow. And then um, thank you very much for attending. Stay safe. And if you have any questions, definitely reach out to me or to Rakesh and Arvind, uh, who were on the webinar. And then, um, you know, yep, good luck. And thank you so much for attending. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.